Hey guys, Britt here. Welcome to End Times Bible Prophecy. Make sure to hit the subscribe, like, share, and restack buttons. Well, this is coming, and you better be prepared. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about a global depression. And when I say it's coming, really it's already here, depending on where you live, what circumstances you face. But what is coming is going to be recognition by everyone in the world that we're in that global depression. So we're going to talk about why that is, what's happening on the ground right now in this video. We're going to talk about why you need to be prepared, and you need to be prepared in more ways than financially. So make sure you stay tuned to the end to find out what you need to make sure you have done. So, let's start with this right here from the Financial Times. This says investment banks cut China GDP forecast as confidence wanes. And we've talked about China is locked in a deflationary spiral, which is what we saw during the Great Depression. They're ahead of the rest of the world in this respect, and we can't just assume the second largest economy in the world can go into a deflationary spiral and the rest of the world is immune. So this says investment banks are cutting their growth forecast for China, believing Beijing risk undershooting its official target of about 5% as confidence wanes in the world's second largest economy. And I want you to make note of that because you're going to hear a lot of that in the weeks and months ahead. Confidence wanes. We need to restore confidence as if bad policies had nothing to do with any of this. It's just all in people's minds. They need confidence. We heard the same thing during the Great Depression. If you go and you read any historical account of the Great Depression, you'll hear all the politicians... <laughs> All the people in government saying, this is a crisis of confidence. We just need to, you need to be real chipper, right? Meaning, meaning it's a, it's all in your head, right? <laughs> None of this stuff's really happening on the ground. I mean, I don't know what they're supposed to say and just say, hey, it's don't have confidence. But the point is, you're going to hear a lot about that. And that's what we're reading here, which indicates what's happening. It says Bank of America on Wednesday lowered its forecast from 5% to 4.8% growth. And Canadian Investment Bank TD Securities cut from 5.1% to 4.7%. I can tell you all of these are, they're just government statistics from China. China's shrinking. It is not growing. It's not growing anywhere near 5%. It's shrinking says the moves followed a UBS cut last week and a series of similar reductions over the summer. Economists at City this week warned that Beijing's official growth target, which is the lowest in decades at around 5%, in other words, their fraudulent made-up growth target, <laughs> which in the past has been much higher, has been revised lower. And it could be at risk adding to mounting concerns over the trajectory of China's economy as policymakers grapple with a prolonged property sector slowdown, we've talked about that numerous times, and weak consumer and investor confidence, right? So it's, it's just weak, weak confidence. They're, they're sitting on piles of cash that they could use to go buy things, stimulate growth, invest in things, but they just lack confidence. It says the median forecast for full-year GDP growth across dozens of economists polled by Bloomberg has slipped to 4.8% compared to 4.9% in mid-August. Last year, China's fake GDP number, <laughs> I added that part myself, grew 5.2% in line with forecast. It says Bank of America analyst in China's, said growth, China's growth engine was sputtering in the second and third quarters, adding that the economy continues to struggle with a confidence problem. So again, it's, a, it's all about the confidence. And no other problems here if we can just restore confidence. 
So we scroll down here and it says UBS has also revised down its China GDP deflator, which reflects the difference between nominal and real prices because it expects, quote, deflationary pressures to persist for longer. So they admit China is in the grips of deflation. I'm not sure how they can be in the grips of deflation and still be growing 5%. But, but while I do know that, when you make up the statistics that say you're growing by 5%, that's how that happens. But according to this, UBS is looking at deflationary pressures to persist for longer. It says ahead of August data releases next week on the economy and inflation, City on Tuesday said China last month suffered, quote, a double whammy of weather shocks and weak demand, pointing to an 8.5% contraction in steel output, widening from 5.3% in July. Hunter Chan, an economist at Standard Charter, which has forecast 4.8% growth for the year, also pointed to the risk of escalating trade tensions between China and other economies on top of the drag from a housing slowdown in the first half. Right now, the government's policy on the housing sector is about stabilizing it, he said. And again, if we go back to the Great Depression, we saw escalating trade tensions. We saw Smoot-Hawley raised tariffs in the United States. It led to this trade war all around the world with tariffs going up as nations tried to protect their domestic economy. It's a political thing. You tell your voters, you're gonna, we're gonna protect jobs, right? We're gonna protect your jobs by erecting these tariffs, but that just makes the situation worse. It says China missed its 2022 GDP target, expanding just 3% on a goal of 5.5% after stringent COVID lockdowns. A drumbeat of disappointing data releases this year has spurred calls for more government stim stimulus. Alex Liu, a strategist at TD Securities, project projected Beijing would miss its target again this year unless there was a mid-year budget expansion, citing faltering spending, a lack of private investment, and pessimism taking hold among domestic companies and major importers. So again, it's a crisis of confidence. Pessimism has taken hold. Otherwise, everything would be wonderful, right? <laughs> and they just completely ignore years and years of terrible economic policies, mismanagement of the monetary system globally, not just in China, but all around the globe, blowing these big bubbles, things like, hey, let's build giant cities that no one lives in with borrowed cash and then expect we can do that forever <laughs> with no consequences. That's why we're, ha we're seeing these problems, not a crisis in confidence. So let's take a look at this article. This is from Yahoo Finance, which I guess took it from Fortune. It says, Timu's woes are fresh signs of the doom loop headed for China's economy. Chinese e-commerce giant Timu is the latest warning sign that the world's second largest economy could be heading for a doom loop caused by overproduction in Beijing's industrial planning. Yes, so centralized planning was the cause of the Great Depression and the cause here too. They let the free market reign, wouldn't have all these problems. It says PDD Holdings, the parent company of Timu, and Penduo Duo stunned Wall Street on Monday with, a weak, with weak quarterly results and a warning that intense competition will dampen future earnings. Shares sank more than 30%, wiping out $50 billion in market value and ending founder Colin Huang's short-lived reign as China's richest man. In an analysis written before the earnings report, a top China scholar described an economic landscape that helped explain the company's woes. Other China watchers have blamed the recent stagnation on the real estate meltdown, the company's aging population, and President Xi's tighter grip on economic policy. I'm sure all of those things are a factor. But a longer-term driver is Beijing's deco decades-old strategy 
of favoring industrial production over all else, resulting in enormous overcapacity. Wrote Zoyang Zolu, a China scholar at the Council on Foreign Relations and Foreign Affairs magazine. And I would say, no, it's the policy of blowing bubbles, creating cheap, cr easy credit, cheap cash, printing currency, loaning it out into the economy and creating, again, cities that nobody lives in, trying to do this over and over. That's what creates this overcapacity. Again, it's what we saw in the Great Depression. We saw the creation of the Federal Reserve. And then that led to the easy credit conditions that created the expansion known as the Roaring Twenties. And then that was when that bubble, when that credit bubble collapsed, we had the Great Depression. We're seeing the same thing here. It says, simply put, many crucial economic sectors, China is producing far more output than it or foreign markets can sustainably absorb. As a result, the Chinese economy runs the risk of getting caught in a doom loop of falling prices, insolvency, factory closures, and ultimately job losses. So what he's really describing here is a deflationary spiral, which we've been talking about, which is what happened during the Great Depression. You have these things take place. Why does falling prices necessarily lead to insolvency? Well, if you've taken on a bunch of debt and you can only service that debt, if everything goes right and then something doesn't go right, then you have to default on that debt. And often that leads to bankruptcy, factory closures, job losses, and then the People have lost their jobs, they can't make their mortgage payment or pay their auto loan or pay their student loan or whatever it is. And, and this creates a spiraling crisis of defaults. And we've, we've looked at the, the monetary system we have is a Ponzi scheme that requires ever greater amounts of debt to be taken on by individuals, corporations, and governments in order to sustain itself. And the moment no additional debt is taken on, the whole thing collapses. And so there is an end point. The only question is, when do we reach it? And I think in China, they've hit that point. It says, when profits shrink, companies boost production higher and drop prices lower to generate enough cash to service their debt, Liu explained adding that government-designated priority sectors also sell products below cost to meet political goals. This dynamic has been destabilizing the global market with a flood of cheap Chinese exports, creating a sharp backlash in the form of stiff tariffs. As this is like a, a, a total replay of the Great Depression. <laughs> Again, we saw the same dynamic at play then, and all these calls to erect tariffs to create trade barriers because, well, we're losing domestic jobs to these cheap foreign imports. So we're seeing the same thing playing out right now. It says the domestic market is also marked by overproduction and cutthroat price competition that risk sending the economy into deflation. And again, that what's wrong? The free market is supposed to lead to cutthroat price competition and deflation. In fact, that's what we had in much of the world in the late 19th century when we saw an explosion in the standard of living and we saw the industrialization of many nations. Because that, but that was on a standard where the monetary system was gold and silver coins. And now we have this debt-based monetary system that requires more debt to be taken on. And when it can't be paid back, it isn't. And you had this deflationary spiral, as you did in the Great Depression and as we're seeing happen right now. It says the top-down focus on industrial targets has been accompanied by an explosion of debt among local governments and businesses, because that's the system that's been created, more of which are becoming, quote, zombie companies that are essentially bankrupt, but have just enough cash flow to meet credit obligations. So guys, this isn't, zombie companies isn't something that 
uh, only China has. There's estimated to be about 7,000 of these globally, 2,000 in the United States. 10% of the Russell 2000 index of so publicly traded companies are estimated to be these zombie companies. So we're not talking one or two man shops that have done some, made some poor decisions. We're talking fat, fairly large enterprises that their operations, all the cash generated by their operations as a business is just enough to meet their credit obligations. So if something goes wrong, the slightest thing, if everything doesn't go perfectly, or if you have to refinance that debt at higher rates, because interest rates have gone up in the past several years, then all of a sudden those zombie companies, they no longer exist. They can't meet those obligations and they go bankrupt. So we're on the verge of seeing that in many parts of the world, and they're saying that's what we're seeing in China. Let's turn back to the Financial Times where we have this. Chinese officer, offices emptier than during COVID pandemic as slowdown hits. So worse, worse than when the, the globe essentially shut down. It says offices in China's biggest cities are emptier than they were during stringent COVID-19 lockdowns and what analysts say is a sign of how the country's economic slowdown has hurt business confidence, right? Not, not it's hit businesses or it's destroyed household budgets. None of, none of those things. It's just the, it's a confidence game, right? But we'll look at why this is toward the end of the article, because they bury the good stuff at the end. It says, at least a fifth of high-end office space was vacant in the tech hub of Shenzhen in June, according to data from three real estate agencies, while office vacancy rates in Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shanghai were also higher than in June 2022. Overall, rents are at least 10% lower than they were two years ago. So that's what you see in a deflationary environment. We would expect to see those go down over time. It says the rise of flexible working has made it hard for developers to fill office space in cities such as London and San Francisco. But in Chinese cities, where far fewer people work from home, analysts said a slowing economy was at fault. The biggest challenge is still the significant reduction in market demand due to the weakening of China's economic growth expectations, said Lucia Leung, Greater China Research and Consultancy Director at Knight Frank. The central government has set a full-year economic growth target of about 5%. We've talked about how that's just a made-up number. They'll game it to meet it because that's what the party officials have to do. But in all likelihood, they're shrinking. And as we scroll down, we find we get some anecdotal evidence of why that tells us why this is. So as one lawyer at a major Chinese firm said they recently cut half of their space in an office building in Beijing's central business area due to downsizing and cost saving. Zhang, a leasing manager at an office building in Beijing's Lido area, said some smaller clients cannot hold on any longer and most tenants want to renegotiate rent. And when they do that, that puts pressure on whoever took out the debt to buy that building, then they can't service that debt and make those payments. He said the prime office market environment was still poor. Clients are downsizing, added Zhang. Those who used to occupy an entire floor might now use only half a floor. And those who had two continuous floors might also downsize. Hong Kong-based Hang Lung Properties office leasing revenue in mainline, mainland China fell 4% year-on-year on weakened demand in the six months to the end of June. The vacancy level in its flagship office building in Shanghai jumped from 2% in June last year to 12% in June this year. There will be downward pressure ahead Chief Executive Weber Liu told reporters last month, what we hope to do now is to be able to keep our existing tenants. So guys, we're seeing 
this deflationary spiral in China. I want to go back and take a look at this article from the Substack from May six potential triggers for the next global financial crisis. Number one we had on that list was the Chinese property market meltdown. And the reason why we noted that was we said the collapse of these companies and similar defaults on the part of other property developers and individuals threatened to spill over into the wider economy. As a result, the prospect of a deflationary spiral similar to the Great Depression is a real possibility. China is the second largest economy in the world. If it falls into the grip of a deflationary spiral, similar to what the world experienced during the Great Depression, the rest of the world will find it nearly impossible to avoid the same fate. Again, as these Chinese companies, they, they call it dumping uh, steel or other commodities abroad at lower prices. What does that do to their competitors and other nations? And then those competitors call out to their politicians, we can't compete with all these cheap Chinese goods, raise tariffs, and then raising those tariffs simply raises cost on consumers. It slows down economic activity. It's a bad idea, but we continue to do it in many cases. <laughs> so. It says here in this article, the number two uh, trick, potential trigger was a Japanese currency crisis. And we are definitely seeing that play out that erupted into the headlines back on early August, back in early August, when we saw the biggest two day plunge in Japanese stock market history, as we saw an unraveling of the Japanese yen carry trade, which we specifically pointed out in this. And then third, we talked about German deindustrialization. So let's go back and revisit this and see what this says. It said, since reunification over three decades ago, Germany has served as the economic engine of Western Europe. Much of the economic might of German industry depends on cheap energy inputs, primarily in the form of Russian natural gas. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022, Germany has failed in its ability to consistently acquire affordable natural gas and other energy sources to power its economy. Initially, Europe saw skyrocketing energy prices. While those prices are nowhere near peak levels today, Europe still faces energy insecurity and volatile energy prices. This uncertainty and uncertainty is a much better word to use than confidence, right? Because this uncertainty is the result of bad policies that have been put in place. This uncertainty has led many industrial and manufacturing companies to move their operations overseas to countries where energy is more consistently affordable and more readily available. Nothing better illustrates the issues faced by Germany than this September 2022 article highlighting the insolvency of four German companies on the same day. Each of those four German companies boasted over a century, it was more, I think over 130 years for each and every one of them, some of them 150 years, of continuous operations. These companies, all in different industries, managed to survive World War I, Weimar German hyperinflation, the rise of Nazi Germany, World War II, and all the decades since. Yet they all failed in the face of German energy insecurity. And the story is still unfolding. For example, BASF, Europe's largest chemical conglomerate, is fleeing Germany. They're investing billions of dollars in a new large-scale Chinese plant and closing some of their production in Germany. They're hiring new staff in China while shedding German workers. As the German economy contracts, the impact could draw Europe and the rest of the world into depression. So again, we're seeing these businesses close, and it's not just from Russian natural gas, but the green energy policies that have been put in place in Germany, shutting down nuclear power plants that were supplying affordable energy, to many of these industries, they're now shut down. They can't do that. 
So we're seeing this continue. Germany is, depending on who you consult, the third or fourth largest economy in the world. And yet we're seeing this deindustrialization, which is going to lead to the same thing we're seeing in China, this deflationary spiral. It's these workers lose their jobs. They can no longer afford to make their debt payments. And then they'll have less discretionary spending in the rest of the economy. And those businesses will struggle to service their debt as well because everything isn't going perfectly as it had to do in order to service this, this mountain of debt that was taken on. But what are we seeing in Germany right now? Well, we had this from Zero Hedge. It says Volkswagen considers first ever German factory closures as economic troubles mount. So four of the four companies that were over a century old, out of business, BASF leaving, now Volkswagen. It says news broke Monday that Volkswagen is considering plant closures in Germany. The auto giant faces falling profits due to slowing sales in China and other markets. Again, so China and its deflationary spiral, they're not buying Volkswagen's products. So, like, as I said, this isn't going to happen in a vacuum. You can't have the second largest economy in the world contracting and everyone else oh, is immune. And then you have Japan and Germany, the third and fourth largest economies in the world, are having their own problems. As this is a global depression, we're in it right now. We haven't reached the climax of it yet, but people are going to come to realize this sooner rather than later. It says this development comes as Europe's largest economy teeters on the verge of recession after reporting a slight contraction in second quarter growth. Earlier this summer, Volkswagen's Audi revealed a billion dollar investment in Mexico. It's the company's future manufacturing could be overseas in the Americas. So they're going places where they have that energy security. They have reliable energy sources at somewhat predictable prices. It says several financial outlets are reporting Volkswagen's potential factory closure plan, including Bloomberg, which said Volkswagen is considering unprecedented factory closures in Germany and a bid for deeper cutbacks, delivering another blow to Chancellor Olaf Scholz's government. The economic environment has become even tougher and new players are pushing into Europe, VW CEO Oliver Bloom said in a statement adding Germany as a business location is falling further behind in terms of competitiveness. So what is it? Again, he's telling us right here in this article what the problem is. Well, what's wrong with Germany as a business location? Well, they used to have a consistent, reliable, affordable source of energy through nuclear power and Russian natural gas. Following the war in Ukraine, the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline, all these green energy policies, they don't have the cheap Russian natural gas and the nuclear power and the abundance that they used to. So as a, as a business location, Germany... We don't want to be here anymore. That's what all these businesses are saying, whether it's Volkswagen or BASF. And it says that here at the bottom here. It says maybe the West sabotaging Russia's Nord Stream pipeline that hooked Germany on cheap natural gas wasn't such a great idea as Europe's top economic powerhouse becomes less competitive. This only suggests increasing deindustrial risk, loss of jobs, and more socioeconomic discontent across the block. And guys, it could also create a currency crisis in the European Union. Because if you remember back in 2011, they were facing a currency crisis. It was known as the European debt crisis. And you had countries like Greece, Portugal, Italy, these other countries that were facing ever-rising interest rates on their debt. And it, it was Germany, the economic might of Germany, in tandem with the European Central Bank, that ultimately uh, suppressed those interest rates, made them go back down, kept the EU intact. 
if Germany is no longer the economic engine it was, what does that mean for the currency? <laughs> we could see a whole currency crisis in Europe as well. I think we're going to see them all over the world because we're at the end of the road when it comes to fiat currency. But we have a, another article about this in CNN. It says a very serious situation. Volkswagen could close plants in Germany for the first time in history. It says Volkswagen is weighing whether to close factories in Germany for the first time in its 87-year history as it moves to deepen co cost cuts amid rising competition from China's electric vehicle makers. In a statement Monday, the German automaker, one of the world's biggest car companies, said that it could not rule out plant closures in its home country. Other measures to future-proof the company include trying to terminate an employee protection agreement with labor unions, which has been in place since 1994. The European automotive industry is in a very demanding and serious situation, said CEO Oliver Bloom. The economic environment became even tougher and new competitors are entering the European market. Germany, in particular, as a manufacturing location, is falling further behind in terms of competitiveness. So that's what we read in the other article. Again, these other competitors are moving into the European market because they have reliable, affordable energy sources in their home countries. Germany doesn't. They, can't, they can no longer compete with that. So this is weighing down one of the largest economies in the world and the largest economy in the European Union, which collectively the European Union is the largest economy and the largest market in the world. So guys, what does this mean? It means a global depression is coming. It's already here. You know, there's people watch these videos all over the world. So if you're in China watching that, well, the depression is here. If you're in Germany, the depression is here, whether politicians, officials acknowledge that or not. If you're in somewhere where you haven't felt this or seen this yet, well, it's coming and you better be prepared. You need to prepare yourself spiritually, emotionally, mentally, as well as financially for the things that are to come. If you are in debt and have any way of getting out of debt, try to get rid of as much debt as you can. You know, fixed rate mortgage debt, that's that's okay. You know, everybody, not, not everybody, but some people have to have that, no doubt about it. But if you're running up credit card debt, things like that, the Bible would say that's very unwise to do. And if you're reliant on and putting your trust in your finances for your protection or for the life you're living, that is definitely unsound advice. Let's see what Jesus says. This is from Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Jesus says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Guys, there's many people in the world, maybe some of you watching this right now, who have built their house on sand, on shifting sands, and the economic storm that's coming to the world is about to wipe everything out. It's about to be a giant wake-up call to a number of people. Now, the rapture of the church could occur today. I don't know when that's going to take place. That actually is number six on that list of potential triggers for the financial crisis in the Substack article we looked at earlier. So that could make all of this even worse. But if it doesn't occur before then, well, no, no one else will escape that. We're going to have to endure this and go through this. 
You want to make sure that your house, your life, is built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Because, guys, not only is a global depression coming, but something else is coming as well. We read this in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It says, Each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. There is a judgment coming. We are each facing judgment of one sort or another. You might say, well, that doesn't sound like good news. You're telling me all this bad news about how the economy is. We're in a depression. It's going to get even worse. And now I'm facing God's judgment. Guys, there is good news because when we read the next verse of that, then we get this in Hebrews 9, verses 27 and 28, when we add verse 28 to 27. It says, And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes the judgment, so also Jesus Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. So guys, we're all sinners. Bible says we've all fallen short of God's perfect standard. That's what sin is. It means we've missed the mark. God is holy, and we are not. We missed the mark. And the Bible also says the wages of sin is death. That means that because of our sin, we're destined to die and face eternal separation from a holy God. But guys, the good news is that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ came to earth. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He went to the cross and he died and paid the penalty, he paid the price for our sins on the cross when he shed his blood. And then he rose again after three days in victory. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, preparing a place for those who love him, and he's coming back again, guys. So yes, you need to be prepared for what's coming. Both the financial crisis in this world, but also the judgment that we are all facing unless you know Christ, because as Romans 8 verses 1 through 2 tells us, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Guys, that's great news. Jesus has achieved victory on our behalf. There's no need to be fearful or afraid of anything that's coming in this world or anything that any human beings can do to us. If you know Jesus Christ, that's the most important thing that you can do to prepare. Really, it's the only thing that matters. All the rest of this is irrelevant if you do not know Jesus. So guys, if that's the case, invite him into your life today. So what do you think? Maybe you think, nope, the economy's fine. Everything's going great. If you think that, leave your comments below. Let me know what you think. Make sure to hit the like, share, and subscribe buttons. And God willing, I'll see you on Monday. If you want to learn more about the end times in Bible prophecy, make sure to visit my Substack at brittgillette.substack.com. There you'll find my latest videos and articles, as well as notes, where I share the latest news headlines, the articles I'm reading, and the videos I'm watching. Subscribe for free, and each new post on Substack will be sent directly to your email. Just scroll to the bottom of the homepage and hit the subscribe button. As an added bonus, your first welcome email will include a link to a copy of my free ebook, Seven Signs of the End Times. Also, make sure to check out all of my books. Just look up Brit Gillette on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple iBooks, Google Books, Kobo, or anywhere books are sold. Thanks for watching today, and until next time, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.